Tonight, I want us to take a few moments to look at that and uh, one particular example. The church very often cannot meet in open like this in the opulence that we enjoy. I mean, this room is a beautiful room. We have technology here. We have climate control. We have something to eat and drink. I mean, this is pretty wonderful. Cushy chairs. Um, I know churches that meet under a mango tree in Africa. Um, folks that meet in warehouses and folks that meet in various places that are really not official or even whether poverty or in hiding. Um, let's go on and I want you to see an area of the world that is under a lot of persecution. China is a, uh, next to India, the most populous country in the world. And I'm having trouble with this mic. We're going to have to be a little bit patient tonight with that. Um, how many of you like Szechuan? Szechuan, what is it? Szechuan chicken? Is that what it is? What is it called? Szechuan beef? Um, it comes from this region of China in the middle of China. In the, in the capital of this massive region of people is Chengdu. And in Chengdu, um, there is a great persecution that's been going on. Um, back out a little bit. Let me show you the larger map. Over in the western part of China, you see there's the contested area of Tibet and up where it even says China, further up on that. Those are the areas that are Muslim um, based. A lot of Muslims in the western part of China, so there's been a great persecution by the Chinese government on, on Muslims. So that's been a bit of an issue. But that persecution is also spreading to the Christians of China. And because either Islam or Christianity does not recognize the government as the highest authority in our lives, the, the Chinese government is very threatened by that and doesn't want any rivals for them. So um, we, we see this happening. Now technology is allowing them to really keep up with people, and the Chinese are very, very intent on that. And so one area of heavy persecution is China. What's really strange about this is is that we went for about um, 70 or 80 years of severe persecution, and then we went to about 25 or 30 years of a very small amount of persecution. It was getting better and better and better. There was more and more freedom. But in the last few years, there has been a growing under the present administration in China. There are no more term limits for the, for the top government officials in China, which means essentially they have a lifelong dictator. And this lifelong dictator is changing the Constitution and is changing the way in which they operate in order to not only remain in power, but to increase control over the masses, all in the name, first of all, of terrorism and the threat of terrorism safety, but secondly, in the name of just economy of scale. The, the, the populace is so great that they're saying that we have to have these controls in order to main con maintain control over the people. And so in the, in the process of that, they have been removing anything that does not see the government as the ultimate source of authority. And in fact, the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel of his people um, would be among those people. So I want you to notice, notice this town, Chengdu. Um, Chengdu. Um, it is a beautiful city. It is a modern city, as you can see, a glorious place of technology. Lots of technology developed in Chengdu and replicated in Chengdu. Um, that's the Hilton in Chengdu. It is a five-star hotel um, in the country, um, gloriously uh, increased in wealth. But in Chengdu, there's, there's many, many Christians. In fact, there's 68 million Christians in China. Only 32 million of those Christians, of the, excuse me, 23 million of the 68 worship in what is called state-affiliated churches or really official churches. All the rest of them, the vast majority of them, meet in a church that is not recognized by the state. And now the state is saying, if you meet in one of those churches, we are telling you you cannot continue. We're telling you that you cannot meet in a church that we do not sanction. So as a result of that, many churches are being closed, um, and they're picking out a few examples to be very harsh with, and this church is one of them. This is um, the Early Rain Church of Chengdu, Early Rain Reform Church of Chengdu. I want you to see their pastor um, because he is in jail tonight and no one has heard from him in a long time since December, I believe it was the 3rd or the 4th. So here we are in January, about six or eight weeks later, um, we're coming up on this, and he 
uh, six weeks later. Um, he and his wife um, have been arrested. They released his wife, um, and he continues in this. He was one of the lead law professors in the province of Sichuan province. In fact, he was listed as one of the 50 most powerful people in China after he became a Christian. And so he became a Christian in 2004, and, and with, his, with his great, kind of like an Apostle Paul, um, strength of mind and heart, um, devoted himself to the gospel, began really teaching um, a careful gospel, um, was trained very well, tutored very well, and self-studied. So now with their pastor arrested, and over 100 people from the church arrested, um, some of those people have been released, but their pastor and their main leaders have not. And so the church has been sealed. Um, the people are not allowed to meet in the place where they were meeting. Um, they've gone to house churches and meeting in other places, and they're crying out to the Lord um, uh, that, that God would come and work in their midst. Um, and their faith has been very great. I want you to see their faith tonight, and I'm going to ask the guys to turn on the lights just so it's very easy to read this. I'm going to read some of this tonight. We're not going to read all of it, but in May of 2018, so just a few months ago, um, Pastor Wang Yi, this is the pastor, Pastor Wang Yi wrote a statement that in case he was arrested and no one heard from him for two days or more, the statement was to be published. And here is the statement that he prepared in the event that he was arrested. So this was written back in May, and it was released in early December, just a few weeks ago. Notice what it says here. My declaration of faithful disobedience. On the basis of the teachings of the Bible, this is so critical, on the basis of the teachings of the Bible and the mission of the gospel, I respect the authorities God has established in China. For God disposes kings and raises up kings. This is why I submit to the historical and institutional arrangements of God in China. Immediately he is saying, God is the high king over all the earth, and he raises up and he brings down. As a pastor of a Christian church, I have my own understanding and views based on the Bible about what religious or what righteous order and good government is. At the same time, I am filled with anger and disgust at the persecution of the church by this communist regime, at the wickedness of their depriving people of the freedoms of religion and of conscience. But changing social and political institutions is not the mission I am called to, and it is not the goal for which God has given his people the gospel. For all hideous realities, unrighteous politics, and arbitrary laws manifest the cross of Jesus Christ, the only means by which every Chinese person must be saved. They also manifest, or show, the fact that true hope and a perfect society will never be found in the transformation of any earthly institution or culture, but only in our sins being freely forgiven by Christ and in the hope of eternal life. You guys, does it sound like he's on the right track? Yes. He's saying it is not. It is not through government. It is not through anyone or anything else or any other institution by which we can be made right with God. Look at the next paragraph. As a pastor, my firm belief in the gospel, my teaching, and my rebuking of all evil, evil proceeds from Christ's command in the gospel and from the unfathomable love of that glorious king. Every man's life is extremely short, and God fervently commands the church to lead and to call any man to repentance who is willing to repent. Christ is eager and willing to forgive all who will turn from their sins. This is the goal of all the efforts of the church in China, to testify to the world about our Christ, to testify to the middle kingdom and about the kingdom of heaven, to testify to earthly momentary lives about heavenly eternal life. This is also the pastoral calling that I have received. For this reason, I accept and respect the fact that this communist regime, communist regime has been allowed by God to rule temporarily. Now, obviously, that probably makes them very upset. As the Lord's servant John Calvin said, wicked rulers are the judgment of God on a wicked people, the goal being to urge God's people to repent 
and to turn toward him. For this reason, I am joyfully willing to submit myself to their enforcement of the law as though submitting to the discipline and training of the Lord. At the same time, I believe that this communist regime's persecution against the church is a greatly wicked, unlawful action. As a pastor of a Christian church, I must denounce this wickedness openly and severely. The calling that I have received requires me to use nonviolent methods to disobey those human laws that disobey the Bible and God. My Savior Christ also requires me to joyfully bear all costs for disobeying wicked laws. Wicked laws, like wicked laws saying that you may not worship. That is a wicked law. He goes on to describe the great wickedness of what it means to say that someone is not allowed to be told that a Savior has died for them. He says that that may be one of the greatest wickedness, um, the, the, the greatest acts of wickedness that a government could ever perpetuate against a people. That could, ever, that could ever restrict people from saying, you're not allowed to tell others that Christ died for your sins. Because what does that do? That hinders the gospel and the freedom of Christ and the forgiveness of Christ to be known in an earthly realm. Now, we know that God moves beyond all those realms. We know that God works through persecution. He works through when his message is, is being thwarted in order to show his power. He very often moves beyond that, and that is recognized in this. I want to encourage you, as we think about the persecuted church, and as we think about the importance of knowing the gospel and believing the gospel as unto death, as Christ did, that we would remember those who are under persecution and setting an example of faith for us. There are many tonight that they would say, Yes, I am being persecuted, and this is my privilege to associate myself with Christ in the good times and in the bad. And so tonight, as we, as we come to this in-depth teaching of the gospel, why do we take such a, such a moment to intensely look at what, who is our God, and what is his gospel, and what are the false gospels, what are the false cults, that are all around us. And we're really in this study over the next few weeks, we're really looking at cults, um, not only in America, but largely in America. Why? Because this is our environment. These are the people that maybe live next door to you or, or live nearby you or the people that come and knock on your door on a Saturday or something like that sometimes. Um, people that, we, it's often been said that sometimes Baptists make the best um, Jehovah's Witnesses um, we, we, we see this, this thing of people that get sidetracked and then get enticed with false doctrines that maybe that particular cult is answering questions that they have and where there's a void in their understanding and not understanding who God is, not understanding the real gospel. A cult can come along and weave its way in where there is a weakness and to deceive. And we see that happened over and over and over again. And that's part of the reason tonight we continue our study of who is this God and what is his gospel so that we know so well the real thing. If we do not know the real thing, we can be deceived. You remember with me, the, we used the example of my mother-in-law's $100 bill. It's still my mother-in-law's, I guess. I don't know. I haven't spent it yet. But... Um, we noticed this, and we said that if you don't know what the real thing looks like, you can be faked. You can believe in a false thing. And some of the problems with that is suddenly it's yours and nobody else wants it. Some of you have gone to the bank and tried to uh, deposit some money, and they hand a 20 back to you, and they say, that's not ours. Um, we won't accept that. So you are stuck with the consequences. In cults, and false gospels are not so unlike that. Cults and false gospels, those who accept them, bear the consequences of that. And so we, as Bible-believing Christians, we want to be very careful to know what God says in His Word and to be firmly rooted upon His Word so that when the counterfeit comes along, we see it before it ever comes into our possession. 
We want to be careful with that. And so notice with me, last week we looked at five threads, five threads, and, uh, but as we, yes, go ahead and back up. We, the, the title, you're doing good, Michael. The one true gospel of the one true God. Now last week we looked at the one true gospel. And as we looked at the one true gospel, that was in the first part in page nine, notice these five threads. And you don't have to look in your notebook, just look on the screens, these five threads. Number one, the character of God. Number two, we saw the sinfulness of man. Number three, we saw the sufficiency of Christ. Number four, the necessity of faith. And number five, the urgency of eternity. And so we we see this grand, holy, just God And then we see mankind sinful and not at all able to be united with this God in our own strength or in who we are. So the sinfulness of man. But because there was a Messiah, Christ, and he is completely perfect and sufficient to unite us to God. And what what must we do in order to have the sufficiency of Christ made manifest in our lives? It's to have faith in him. Now, any of these can be too short. Um, that's why you need the notes to go back and remember the passages that we looked at in the statements that are there that God is holy, man is sinful from the start, all of us. Christ is perfectly sufficient to pay for our sins. But the necessity of faith, it's not just faith in faith. It's not, I mean, that's what George Michael sang about. You've got to have faith, 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 just got to have faith, faith, faith. And, you know, and you'll hear that all the time. In the grocery store, you'll hear that all the time at Thanksgiving dinner with somebody, or you'll hear that all the time on shows, TV. Well, you know, you just got to have faith. You got to be a person of faith. Well, the question is, faith in what? Faith in who? Because you see, you can be putting your faith in some collective good that you see. You can be putting your faith in church or faith ultimately in your own behavior. You say, well, I go to church. Isn't that what I'm supposed to do? And see, if, if you say that these are the things that bring me into right relationship with God, you're ultimately putting your faith in something besides the Lord Jesus Christ. So um, the necessity of faith, and I probably should have put in there, the necessity of faith in Christ alone. Christ alone. We see that. We saw that very intensely last week. So if you have your notebook, go ahead and, and um, just go to our section for tonight. Um, so we, we looked, first of all, at the one true gospel, and now we come tonight to the one true God. And um, if I had written this, um, I probably would have reversed those two things. I would have probably looked at the one true God first and then the one true gospel. But I, I'm, I'm glad for this as we look at that both are very, very basic to us. And so we're going to fly as we study and as we go. The one true God, one of the key things that we need to begin to grapple with when we look into who God is, is his divine nature. And in his divine nature, one of the things that the Gospel of John, when we spent three years studying the Gospel of John, we saw over and over and over again this very important unpacking that especially the Gospel of John gives us in the the realization of who God is in his being. The Trinity, what we call in the Trinity. The word Trinity is not in the Bible. Um, You never find that word in the Bible. That is an understanding of of coming through the theologies that are presented in Scripture. And we come to the the realization that this God is one in three. We want to look at that. This is so critical for our understanding. Many cults in many other religions and many counterfeit gospels confuse this doctrine. And that's why this is so important. As Christians who study the Bible, we need to really clearly understand that God is three persons. Notice this, God is three persons. The scripture refers to God with plural pronouns. The scripture refers to God with plural programs, do you, pronouns. Do you have your pen? Get ready. I want you to circle a few words in Genesis 1, 26. By the way, let me remind you that a lot of the notes that are under each point are scripture. In fact, the vast majority of them are straight out scripture. This is so that you can go back and look at it and read it. We're not going to read very many of them. We're going to read some of them. And I want you to notice that the reference is at the end of the passage on each one of these. Okay, so everybody's noticing this. This is scripture. The first one is found in Genesis what? 
Very good. Genesis 1. And in Genesis 1, this is the beginning of the Bible, okay? In Genesis 1, we see these plural pronouns used to show us who God is. It's very important for us to see. You need to know where this is in the Bible. Genesis 1, look what it says. Then God said, let us, circle the word us, make man in what? Our, circle the word our. Let us make man in our image after what? Our likeness. So we see these, these, these plural pronouns. You say, well, who's the we here? Well, it's speaking of God. Notice this. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds and the heavens of the air and the livestock and all of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So at the very beginning, we see that the creator God is referred to in the plurality of of three persons. Notice the next part here. Let us, this is Genesis 11 in verse 7, let us go down and confuse their language. So at Babel, when the people were getting haughty and God said, I'm going to confuse them because they, they are going to be, they're going to destroy themselves as they seek to make a name for themselves, God says, let us go down. So these are the first hints, and there's even more hints in Genesis 1 that take a little bit more time to unpack, but these are the first hints of the plurality of the nature of God. In Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 8, we see it again. So over in the prophets, we see this. I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Who is the us? The picture here is the Godhead um, in the, the holy throne room of heaven. You see, this is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are persons. They are persons with personality. They are distinct persons in their persona, in their image of their likeness, in their being that God has made up. Is the Holy Spirit a person or a power? Put out there to the side, not an it, but a a he. The Holy Spirit is not an it. We shouldn't refer to the Holy Spirit as an it. What did the Holy Spirit do? Well, it came into my heart. No, he came into my heart. The scripture refers to the Holy Spirit as a he, not an it, not an impersonal being, but a personal being. That's the picture. That's the point. Look at John 6 and verse 13. When the spirit of truth comes, what does it say? He, circle the word he. He will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Now, Colvin and everybody else makes fun of me, because in the first three years that I was here, and we taught through John, I said, do you all know what I'm going to do? When we start talking about the Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit, and we shared some examples, some diagrams, and some illustrations during that time of helping us see that it's, it's this beautiful, perfect harmony of God. What we have often heard called the, whole, the happy land of the Trinity. In the happy land of the Trinity, there is no dissension. In the happy land of the Trinity, there is no dishonor. There is perfect unity. The Father and the Son and the Spirit operate in perfect perfect unity. We have a God in himself that is perfectly relational with no corruption and with no hint of that which would be selfishness. This is the nature of God in his very being as seen in who he is as Father, Son, and Spirit. And he made us to relate to him in that kind of purity with nothing in the way. No sin, no, no evil, no wickedness in our heart, no separate, no selfishness that would separate us from his perfect nature. But in our fallen nature, the relationship with God is torn asunder. It's torn apart. And this is why we need a perfect Savior to reunite us to a perfect God. And so notice here with me as we go very quick, the Spirit not only is a person, not a power. It teaches, excuse me, see how easy it is? He teaches, I said it teaches. He teaches us, the Spirit teaches us. But the, Holy, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. He will teach you, see that? He teaches, that's what he does. 
And he brings to your remembrance all that I've said to you. This is the, one of the great purposes that God works out through the power of his Spirit in us. The Spirit bears witness. You see in Romans 8, 16, for the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So he comes and he confirms within us. The Spirit intercedes. The Spirit searches. The Spirit knows. Top of page 21, the Spirit gives gifts. This is what we call the gifts of the Holy Spirit, that He comes and gifts us um, with different things that manifest Him. The Spirit speaks. Now notice this in Acts 8.29 under that. The Spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So the Spirit doesn't, isn't just a feeling a lot of people think of the Spirit, oh, I had chills, I'm just the Holy Spirit. You know, but but we, we see that there's, there's so much more than that. It's not so mystical in exactly as, as very often um, the present culture would have us to believe. It's very clear. The Spirit is grieved. We do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. The Spirit can be grieved and the Spirit can seal us in Him. The, you see, fill this in, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are distinct persons. They, while, while they are one in this, and while they are persons, they are distinct persons. They're just, they're not the same. Um, and when Jesus was baptized, look at, and we see all three of them here in this passage. Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. And Jesus was baptized. Immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. It's not a dove. Like a dove. And coming to rest on him. So the Spirit comes in the form of a dove. Like a dove. And to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Do you see all three of these here? Jesus, the Spirit, and the like of, like of the dove, and the voice from heaven of God the Father. So Father, Son, and Spirit, we see all right here. Um, Matthew 28, 19 through, or 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When we baptize in our church, we are careful to do what this says to baptize those in the name of the Holy Trinity, in the name of God. So when someone is baptized, like Adonis was baptized last week, um, uh, Bill Loudon said, I baptize you, my Christian brother, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So this is the representation of God's baptism upon us, God's renewal in bringing us to himself. So, um, several things there that we, we could see and look at that and spend some time with that. But look down at the bottom of page 21. The Son is distinguished from the Father. So, so these are different persons. Look what it says in verse 21. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and then look, underline it, He was in the beginning with God. So here's the picture of God the Son with God the Father but distinct. Notice the next page, page 22. The Spirit is distinguished from the Son. And this is Jesus speaking, and he says these words, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. Jesus said, I'm going to go so that one can come. And so this is a, di this is a difference. Jesus is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not Jesus. You say, okay, my brain is starting to heat up. And I'm saying, okay, well, what then? Well, let's keep going. You'll see. The Father is distinguished from the Spirit. Look at Romans 8, 27. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So who is he? This is God the Father. He who searches the hearts, that is the mind of the Holy Spirit. So truth number two. So truth number one uh, that we've looked at here is first and foremost is that God is three persons. Truth number two is that each person is fully God. Not one of the persons of the Trinity is not fully God. All three persons of the Trinity is fully God. Now, if, if you were going to say, well, if one of them wasn't fully God, which one, if you were going to guess, most of the world would say, which one would you guess would be the likely culprit that maybe is not fully God? Okay, I'm hearing two different words. Larry Metzger said the Holy Spirit, and I heard T.J. say Christ. 
But then you, you kind of look at the Father and you go, well, everybody would agree he's full of God. But what, I don't know that much of it. You see, we can be confused about this. And this is why we need to look and see what the Bible says. Notice what it says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 8. Yet for us, there is one God, the Father from whom all things, in whom, excuse me, from whom are all things and from whom we exist. So the word God sometimes is referring to this picture of God the Father, but other times it's referring to Father, Son, and Spirit. And we have to be careful to notice the context of what is being said. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor they gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not, are you not of more value than they? Notice the next one. God the Father is fully God. We see this. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So the, the picture is this God, Father heart of God, is fully God. Look at the next one and circle this. God, the Son, is fully God. Now there were councils and creeds and debates and in the early life of the church, there, were, there, were, there was a whole history of them looking at the New Testament letters and looking at the Gospels and saying, what does this say who Jesus is? And so there were very, very important debate going on about that. And there were heresies that came into the church seeking to deny Jesus as being the eternally existent co um, the, the, the co-person of God, the, the Trinity uh, person of God, and not recognizing him as fully God. Notice this in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. We've read, the, we read this passage many times in the life of our church. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in who? In Christ Jesus, who though, look at what it says. Notice the Christology here and notice the, the Trinitarian nature of what it's describing who Jesus is who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped or held onto. But he emptied himself, and by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now look at the next part. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is what? Lord to the glory of the Father. So here's, here's this picture again. Within the Trinity, in the happy land of the Trinity, the Son is giving glory to the Father, and the Father is giving glory to the Son. And that's what we see here at the end of this, that we would confess that Jesus, though born of a virgin, though born into human flesh, he is declared as Lord to what? The glory of the Father. And so we we see this this beautiful relationship that completely and and without any uh, division unites under the very essence of who God is. Look at the bottom of, of... uh, page 22, and this is Hebrews 1.3. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Only God can do that. And so we see Jesus is fully God. After making purifications of sins, he sat down at the majesty on high. So Titus chapter 2, verse 13 waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of our glory, of our great God, here it is so clear, God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus was God. If there's ever been a question, ever been confusion about that in your mind, I, just want, I want you to see that the Bible very, very, very clearly says Jesus is God. I won't tell you who said this, um, but I'll just say it was somebody here in town that does not go to our church. Um, when I moved into my house where I live, I met someone in relationship to that, 
and we were talking, and I invited um, the guy to church. I said, hey, I, I would love for you to come to our church. I didn't tell him I was a pastor. I just said, hey, I, I go to Sheridan Hills, and I'd love for you to come. And he goes, oh, Sheridan Hills, yeah, it's a Baptist church, right? And he said, yeah, it sure is. Well, I'd love for you to come. He said, yeah, well, my brother-in-law is on staff at a Baptist church here in town. And I said, really? That's amazing. He told me which church, and we talked for a little bit. And this guy actually is a doctor. And so um, I said, um, well, I, I'd really love for you to come. Our church really just focuses on the Bible, and it's try, seeking to really be Christ-centered and so forth. And, and um, that just means everything to us, um, and I, would just, I think that you'd love to come. And so he said, well, you know, I, I get into church every now and then, but he said, as soon as they start going with all that Jesus is God stuff, I'm just done. I said, really? He said, yeah, I mean, I'm a Christian and all, but I just don't believe Jesus is God. I mean, his, his immediate attack was annoyance with this very doctrine that Jesus was God. And so I said, wow, that was, he just said it. He put it out there. And um, as time has gone on, we've talked about that a few times. Um, and, he's, and, you know, and I just want you to understand, if you hear us say Jesus is God a lot and we make a big deal about that, there's a very good reason for that. Because to say that Jesus is not God, then we find ourselves at odd with the God sacrifice that God made for us. We are, we are in conflict with what he has said. And so, um, so many beautiful passages on it. Not only that, but the Holy Spirit is God. Um, look, what, look what we see in Acts chapter 5 and verse 34, right in the middle of page 23. The God the Spirit is fully God. So just kind of circle that. God the Spirit is fully God. I want you to pay attention. Look what it says. And Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back your part, yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart you have not lied to man, but to who? But to God. And so this is, at the beginning of this, we see he's talking about you lied to the Holy Spirit, and now we see the scripture is saying that this Holy Spirit that you lied to, you've lied to God. And so very, very clearly, the Spirit is God. Now, there's two parts of this, and you can see it on the screen here. God the Father is fully God. God the Son is fully God. God the Spirit is fully God. But, so, but the Spirit has this beautiful omni, omnipresent uh, character about him that is a, a glorious thing that we see over and over again in the scripture. So in Psalm 139, David writes, where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? If I send to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold there, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn and go and dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Now, those particular words are on a huge brass plaque off of Key Largo, Florida, around a bronze statue called Christ of the Abyss. How many of you have ever seen the Christ of the Abyss statue? Some of you have snorkeled over there and seen it. And if you go down there, you'll see a big brass plaque with this passage put there. And it's talking about this picture of the fact that God is everywhere. And he's everywhere through his spirit. Now, we go and get a big brush each time we go down there, and we take a big brush and we, we get all the algae or all of the growth off of it because we want everybody to read that thing. We, we go down there, and I hold my breath. Sometimes if I'm not scuba diving, if I'm just skin diving, I go down there and I scrub, 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 and then I go up, take a breath, and I come back down and I scrub, scrub. And all these other people, all these snorkelers are wondering, they're going, what is that guy doing down there with a brush <laughs> cleaning the thing? And they say, oh, you're cleaning the statue? I said, nope, cleaning the plaque. I want you to read the plot. And then they start coming, you know, there's all these people up there from the big boats, and they're all there, and they're sitting there diving down there, and they're reading it as long as they can. But the picture is, is that the Spirit is what is this, this, this aspect of God's nature that is everywhere all the time through His Spirit. Notice the next one. Not only that, the Spirit is omniscient. We see this in, throughout the Scripture as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 is an example of it. These things God has revealed to us through the Holy Spirit. For the Spirit searches what? Everything. everything. Even the depths of God. So the Spirit knows everything. We, we've, we've seen even Jesus say, I, 
I don't know this, and it's because he has taken on human form, and so the form of Christ, you say, well, there's some things Jesus doesn't know. Do I need to? No, that's different. His, his role was in that time. That'd be great, babe. Thanks. And so, but we see here that as he comes and as he works and as he moves, he is doing it. My, you know, it's really good when your wife knows what you need. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Notice this with me, that it, it is the spirit that is omnipresent, he's everywhere, and the spirit is omniscient and in perfect harmony. Father, Son, and Spirit play out their beautiful presence with us. Look at the uh, number 23, or page 23, truth number three. Not only is this God, is each person fully God, but there is one God. And this is incredibly important for Christians to understand. There is one God. This does not mean that there are three gods. There is one God. And I want you to see this in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is, underline it, the Lord is what? One. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, and with all of your might. Deuteronomy 6. This is, this is part of what we see, the great instruction upon Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. It's not like many gods. No, we don't, we're not polytheists. We don't believe in many gods. The Phoenicians believed in many gods. The Philistines believed in gods. The Greeks, of course, believed in many gods. We, we don't have many gods in which we believe in. We see that there is one God, and he is the Lord. Look at Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 5 through 6. I am the Lord, underline it, and there is no other Besides me, there is no God. This is God speaking through the prophet of Isaiah. I equip you, though you do not know me, that the people may know, that the people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west, and there is none besides me. Underline that part. There is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. So twice, this beautiful picture of, of the scripture is just underlining, underscoring the fact that there is one God in this climactic prose. Okay, so he is fully God. There is one God. God is, is revealed in three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit, in perfect harmony. We, we would be in perfect harmony with one another except for the fact that we have sin. And, of course, we are the created, not the creator, uh, which, which we'll see here in just a moment. But I want you to see this. There are three additional notes regarding the Trinity that can really help. And I think some of you right now are about to be blessed because there's aspects of this that you've wondered about and no one has ever taught you the mechanics of the systematic theology that can be very helpful to you. And so I'm praying that some things will really come together in the next couple of minutes for some of you that you're going to go, oh, I got it. Or, oh, it's okay if I don't fully got it. It's not like everybody else gets it, and I don't fully get it. I want you to see tonight this beautiful picture. First of all, the Trinity is a mystery. The Trinity is a mystery. This is part of the deep things of God. This is part of the deep nature of God. And we are finite beings, and He is an infinite God. And so the first thing we want you to see is that the Trinity is a mystery not a contradiction. You see, in our human thinking, in, in our present world, we would say, well, how in the world can three persons be one? And, you know, we, we have all kinds of things that we say about that, but I just want you to see and first get it that there is no contradiction in the Scripture concerning this, and we're, we're going to unpack that a little bit. God's, look at the next statement there underneath that. God's threeness underline the word threeness. You've probably never seen that word before. Um, God's threeness, this means that he is three in one, and oneness are different. They are two different issues. Um, they're not exactly the same thing. God is three in a way that is different from being one. And so he's three in person, but he's one in being. Three in person, but one in being. It's a very important aspect for us to start to wrap our brain around a little bit as best we can. So notice this. We would often say that a contradiction, we would say God is one and not one. Well, that's not 
that's not exactly accurate in this. We, we, we would say this was the, the way that our human logic would stop. But look at the next part. A mystery. God is one in three. That is an accurate statement. He is one in three persons. Now, the other thing that we must understand is not only that, that this is a mystery, and it's okay for it to be a mystery, um, but this trinity is eternal. You say, why is that important? This trinity is important. I want you to, I want you to understand this and see this and um, skip down to the three statements underneath that where it says, the Father has always been and always will be God. The Son has always been and will always be God. And the Spirit has always been and always be God. The, Jesus did not come into existence when he was born to Mary. Jesus did not come into existence when God created the world. In fact, in, in John, it makes very clear that he was in the world, the world that he had created, John says. And so, this, by this word is the word by which the world exists. So, this trinity is eternal in all three persons always together. You say, the Father begets the Son. You, that, that doesn't mean the Father bores the Son, is giving birth to the Son. Um, the picture is, is that the Son is eternally coming from the Father, eternally what we call emanating from the Father. I know those are big words, but it's, 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 it's an attempt to understand what the Scripture tells us that there's this beautiful, beautiful harmony within the gospel and within the Trinity that remains forever. Look at the passages there, Genesis 1, 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. You see, the Spirit is there, and the picture of the Spirit very clearly is there, mentioned there. And then look at Colossians 1, verse 15 through 16. He is the image, this is talking about Jesus, so right above the word he, Jesus. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. I love this passage. The firstborn of all creation, that means the most important and the preeminent of all of creation. For by him, look what it says, all things were what? Created. This means he was before time. This means he is eternal. Jesus is eternal. All things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, or all things were created through him and for him. So this God, if we begin to wrap our brain around the fact that three persons, all fully God, always God, and always eternal in this, this is very helpful to us. Look at the next part here. Not only is the Trinity eternal, but we see the three persons of the Trinity are equal in terms of God's essential attributes. And the essential attributes, um, and there's, there's many different ways to list this, but notice these three things. All-powerful, all-knowing, loving, and just. Um, out there next to just, you can put the word holy. Um, all of these point to holiness, but we see that he is a just God. He is a God who, who is right, and he demands righteousness. Um, look at Deuteronomy 32, verse 4. This is one of my favorite verses that I often quote. quote. In fact, this verse has helped me. In fact, if you would, would you please put a big, huge circle around the whole thing, Deuteronomy 32 and verse 4? This is a great verse for you to memorize because there are so many things that seek to attack the goodness of God. Satan seeks to attack the goodness of God in your brain. He wants you to doubt that God is good. And this is one of the most obvious and clear statements that God is good. Notice what it says. The rock, his work is perfect. All his ways are, what does it say? Justice. Justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity or without injustice. And look what it says just and upright is he. Okay, now, last week I mentioned a song that no one knew. And you all looked at me like, Romans 10, 9 is a favorite verse of mine. And everybody said, no, nobody heard that. But I know that some of you have heard the verse that this comes from. Anybody, know, anybody can hum it? How about this, guys, from back in the 80s? Ascribe greatness to our God, the rock. His work is perfect, 
and all his ways are just ascribed. Do y'all remember that? Golly, what's the matter with you people? <laughs> Pastor Lucas, I don't know what to do. It goes on. A God of faithfulness and without injustice, good and upright is he. A God of faithfulness without injustice, good and upright is he. Um, Sorry, those songs that hit you when you're young and growing, man, they're hard to give up. Some of y'all love Elvis, I know. It's because it it was important to you when you were growing up or Journey or Boston or something else. Okay, all right. So this beautiful, I'm red, okay. So this beautiful picture of all who God is, is is spread out across Father, Son, and Spirit. Father, Son, and Spirit. Father, Son. That's a God, Fun. Okay, Father, Son, and Spirit are all-powerful, all-knowing, loving, and just. Ultimately, we see this is the Trinity in its nature, in His nature revealed to us distinctly, and and here's how the Trinity is revealed to us. The the Trinity is revealed to us in, first of all, the work of creation. Now, what we mean by this is God is creating, and we are seeing that He is God. Look what it says here. God the Father speaks, Psalm 33, verse 6, by the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the mouth, by the breath of His mouth, all their hosts. So, the worlds are made, all that is made, is, is made through the voice of God, the Father. Also, God the Son. Look at John 1, 3. All the, I quoted this a minute ago. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So nothing has come into existence without Jesus. Nothing. Look at the next part. The Spirit brings to this, con- to this completion. Notice what it says in Genesis 1-2. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So creation, in creation, we see this not only mentioned in um, Genesis, but also in the references to the creation in who God is. So this is the, the, the two that are listed here. We see the Trinity in creation, but we, I love this part, and we're going to finish with this. This is beautiful. We see the Trinity in our salvation, that all three persons of the Godhead are working together to save us. And this is how we see, in all three of them working to save us, this is how we see the great, sacrificial, beautiful love of God the whole God, working to bring you to himself. This is the beautiful picture that he would not only create you in his being, but he would save you. Notice this with me, and it's at the top of page 26. Circle those words, the work of salvation. Don't want you to miss that and lose it up at the top of the the thing. The first one is God the Father sends his Son for our salvation. So the Father sends His Son for our salvation. Let's all read John 3.16. Here it is right here. Let's read it out loud. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have ever eternal life. This is the beautiful picture of the Father and the Son working to bring us salvation. Look at 1 John chapter 4 and verse 14. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be what? The Savior of the world. So here we see it. Now, so that's the Father sends the Son for our salvation. Look at the next part, the next bullet point. Read it out loud together. What's the next bullet point say? God the Son becomes incarnate for our salvation. Put above the word incarnate, flesh. That's what that means. Chili con carne is chili with flesh. So notice that there, meat. So God comes into flesh to save us. Um, look at John 1, 14, just below that. And the Word became what? And dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. So God the Son becomes flesh for our salvation. Now look down at God the Spirit applies to us the blessings of salvation. So the Holy Spirit is involved in saving you. The Holy Spirit is involved in drawing us to God 
manifesting our hearts, opening our minds and our hearts so that we can see what God has done, what the Father and the Son have done. So look at Galatians chapter 4 and verse 6. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. This is the beautiful, sovereign work of God who comes into His children and cries out within you, Abba, Father. So because of His Spirit, you begin to hear His voice and you recognize who He is because God's work has done the work of illuminating your heart, of showing you who he is and what he has done. Um, this is the beautiful work of, of the Spirit and the Son and the Father working together for our salvation. Look at Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. Also, it makes it very clear. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, this is that someone died for you. He says, and believed in him, underline it, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So those who have believed upon Christ through the Holy Spirit crying out, Abba, Father, within us, and and we see this great gift that God has given us of salvation. And, And when that happens, while we're not yet with him, the Holy Spirit says, you are mine, and nothing is gonna ever change that. You are safe in me. You are completely safe in me. I don't lose any of the ones that the Father gives me, Jesus would say. And so we we see that the Spirit loses none in this. And this is a, a glorious message of the sure salvation, the secure salvation that God gives us. And that, so that's, that's part of our, our three practical conclusions of the Trinity. I want you to see these. Um, notice this, top of the screen up there, three practical conclusions. And the first one is, if all these things are true, which they are, God is worthy. He is perfectly just. He is perfectly powerful. He is perfectly gracious. He is perfectly all-knowing. And so because of all of that, He is worthy. He is worthy of all that we could ever imagine. It's appropriate to worship God the Father. It's appropriate to worship the Son. It's appropriate to worship the Spirit. Look at Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. This was, in fact, the first passage of Scripture that I ever preached at Sheridan Hills when I was 16 years old. I preached this passage. Notice what it says. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he did fly, or he, he flew. And one called to another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. This God that we worship is worthy of our worship. And what this is describing, notice what this is describing. It is describing the seraphim angels in the throne room of God, sitting over the place of God. And those angels were created to declare that this is the holy God. This is the holy God. It's as if when you come up near the presence of God, you hear fiery angels declaring constantly This is the holy God. The picture of this is glorious. Notice this. It is appropriate to worship the Father. It's appropriate to worship the Son. It is appropriate to worship the Spirit. And so we we must come to see that this God, in all that He has done and who He is, is worthy of our worship. Not only that, but our mind is, God is, God is worthy, but our mind is finite. Our mind is finite. That means limited. There's a limit. Everybody says, oh, the human brain has no limits. Oh, yeah, it does. Yeah, there's limits. I can't remember what I had for breakfast sometimes, and I, I come up and I meet some of y'all, and I've gotten to know you a little bit, and I love you, and I've prayed for you and everything else, and then you walk up, and I'm like, I got nothing. I, I can't remember your name. I'm sorry. Tell me your name. I mean, that, that just happened. We're very finite people. I mean, there's limits to what we, we can figure out and what we can do. But notice here with me that this God is infinite while we are very finite. And um, 
I, you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 is the picture of this. Um, look what it says. Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age. We are doomed to pass away. You see, we're finite. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages of our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this. You see, we're finite. For if they had, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has entered into the, nor the, man, the heart of man has imagined, different translations, sorry, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of, except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit of him who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, because it's limited, but taught by the Spirit interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. And so I'm just going to stop right there. But the picture is, is that this, this knowledge that we have is simply limited. The greatest rulers of the world are limited. But God knows and enjoys all things. Now, these four points at the bottom of page 27 are very important. The Trinity is divinely revealed, not humanly constructed. What does that mean? The Trinity is divinely revealed. Here's the picture. God reveals the Trinity right here in his word. God shows us and tells us wh who made the world that we live in. And he beautifully weaves together from really the very first chapter of the Bible all the way to the last chapter of the Bible, we see this beautiful revealing of God's nature. If you will study the Bible, you start to see more and more and more of this glorious God. You won't see all of it. Your brain would explode. I mean, Isaiah, from Isaiah 6, finds himself before the Lord in a vision, and he falls down on the ground and says, Woe is me, for I am, you know what the word is? Undone. It's almost like, I'm uncreated. I'm, I'm coming apart. Because he finds himself in the manifest presence of God. And so this, this revealing of God, of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, is not something that mankind came up with, even though the word Trinity is not in the Bible. We have clearly seen the evidence of who God is in the Trinity, excuse me, in the Scripture that we call the Trinity. We simply have reduced it to some terms so that we can start to understand and start to grasp a little bit, that, a little bit of that. So notice this with me, that it is not a revealed, excuse me, it, the Holy Spirit is revealed, not a human idea, not a human construct. It's, it's kind of like this as well. Another thing, another example of this is not only the Trinity, but marriage. It is important to understand that humans didn't come up with marriage. God came up with marriage. This was God's design. And we see from the beginning, from Genesis chapter 1 and 2, we see that it was God's design for men and women to be united together, or a man and a woman to be united together under his obvious design for the purpose of bringing unity to themselves and the the great sharing of, of procreation, that we get to be like God in, in creating. This is, this is the amazing generosity of God that he would allow us to share. And, and for those of you who have, who have had children, you hold that baby in your arm and you go, this is unbelievable. Can you believe this came from me? This is unbelievable. And everybody else goes, yeah, I can't believe that thing came from you. I mean, <laughs> you're just sitting there and you're just, you're amazed that here God had designed that to come together and come up with a DNA chain that's going to allow replication of all of those cells. And this little human being is going to grow. And this little human being is going to be born. And this little human being is going to, is, is going to be manifested as a, as a great generosity of God saying, I'm sharing who I am and what I do with you. That's amazing. And so like marriage, that's the case. Here's another example. 
the church is not created by people. We didn't have a bunch of Christians that got together and said, we've got to call ourselves the church. We've, we've got to get together. If we don't all hang together, we're all going to hang separately. Blah, 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 blah. We, you know, the Jerusalem church did not create themselves. It was God's plan through the ages to have his people. And from the nation of Israel to the beautiful picture of the church, we see this beautiful coming together of God bringing together his people for his purposes. And so the church is not ours, you guys. We call it our church. But this is his church. We are his. And so we need to act like we're his in every way. Okay. Notice the second bullet point there. The Trinity is utterly unique. It's the one and only. Put that above it. It is utterly unique. There is no other Trinity. Um, So any analogy of the Trinity is insufficient. Now, I want you all to help me out a little bit here. What are some analogies that you've heard trying to explain the Trinity? And I'm not going to shoot you down too hard, but I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I've said them too. So I, I just want us to think about that. How have you heard the Trinity explained before? Okay, water. What do you mean by that? Who said that? Who said water? TJ, was that you? Explain it to us, high school student. Tri- uh, What are the three different forms of water? Ice, liquid, and vapor. So, and, and what is the problem with that analogy? Why can't you say, well, the Trinity is like water, ice, liquid, and vapor. What, what's the problem there? It's only one at a time. It's kind of what we would call modalism if we were, if we were applying that to the Trinity. The, the, that God is in this mode, and then he's in this mode, and he's in this mode. That's not the way it works. Any other examples that we've tried to explain the Trinity by? Say, let's say it again. An egg. Lily, tell us about the egg example. Okay, the shell, the yolk, and the white. And so the idea is these are all key components. It's not an egg without any one of those, right? Can't be an egg without the yolk. Can't be an egg without the shell. Can't be an egg without, what's the other one? Um, the white. I've, just white. There's got to be another technical term for that. I don't know what it is. Um, but this is, the, this is the picture that, but that's not the proper example of, of who this is. Um, is there an, another example? Any other example? Yes. Okay, thank you. So, uh, like an individual, Robert is a son of, what was your dad's name? Virgil, your mother's name? So Virgil and Alice had Robert, and so he's the son to them, but he's the husband of his precious wife, Lolly, and he has two beautiful children, and so he's the father of those children, but that doesn't do it. Why? And explain why, Pastor Lucas. Why does that not work? Because he's Is it real person. loud? Today? Because he's one person. He's not three persons. He's one person, one nature. It's just three different ways that he relates to other people. And that's how the Bible teaches about God. The Bible says that God is three distinct persons in one unique nature. So, perfect is that not one person relating in three different ways. But the Bible is making very clear to us, no, this amazing, mysterious, glorious God perfectly exists in three persons. Not four, not two, but three. That's what he does. And this is the beauty of us studying the Word and starting to say, well, how does he work? What does he do? This is unique. Don't don't let someone, don't let someone cheapen the essence of God by impressing an analogy upon it that simply does not do justice to who he really is. Is this helping? Does that help a little bit? Okay. How about the next two that are here? This is, this is very important as we kind of starting to wrap up here. We can know the doctrine of the Trinity. Can we know the doctrine of the Trinity exhaustively? Can we know everything about it? Big, huge No. You're never going to understand it. If somebody comes to you and says, hey, I got the Trinity thing figured out, and I can explain it to you, what you should be is like in the Roadrunner, pew, 
wrong. You, you should take off. Because no one understands this. No one, not the brightest mind on the planet, understands this glorious, unsearchable truth of God's nature. He is far beyond who we are. He is infinite. We are finite. So look at the next question that is there. Can we know the doctrine of the Trinity truly? Yes. We can know the doctrine of the Trinity truly. And what this means is this. You can know what he has told you because he has given you what you need to know. You can know that he exists in three persons. You may not be able to fully explain it. You may not be able to understand all the theory behind it. But this is kind of like, well, what is, what is, what is the point of that? Here's, here's the deal. There's a lot of people that say, well, if I don't really understand something, then I'm, I, I can't really know it and I can't use it. And that is absolutely ridiculous. How many times have you gotten in your car and turned the key and the engine starts and you get in the car and you drive to where it is that you gotta go? You didn't, do you understand everything about how an automatic transmission works? Do you understand everything about the computer system that operates the firing of the cylinders and all of the fuel air mixture and everything else? You don't understand all that. In fact, all you really know, for many of us, just turn the key and it goes, makes a noise and then we go. Lights in the house. I don't understand everything about electricity. I certainly don't understand everything about the air conditioner that Josh just put in my house. I cannot explain that thing to you at all, but I sure am thankful it's there. <laughs> and let me tell you, we use that thing. You know, we turn it on. And that's how it is very often in your relationship with God. You may not know everything and understand everything about him, but that doesn't keep you from, you no, know, I don't understand the air conditioning. We're not turning on <laughs> until we understand it. How stupid would you be? Everybody look at you like you're stupid. The picture is you're never going to understand all of the issues of God, but you understand what he's told you, and you come and you search of him, and you come to learn of him and know him and enjoy him. Finally, and this is so beautiful, great note for us to end on as we look at the true gospel and the true God. Our salvation is secure. The Trinity shows us that our salvation is secure. In Ephesians chapter 1, 3 through 14, I encourage you to read that tonight. That will bless you as you just see that this beautiful sealing, this beautiful salvation that God gives us, and it's an, an inheritance, and then it's a possession that is to the praise of his glory that is forever. And so all this points to these last two points, that we are not saved by a creature. We are not saved by a creature. We are saved by the Creator. The one who created everything is the one who saves you from hell, saves you from yourself, saves you from his own wrath. And then look at the last one there. The one who saves us completely is completely God. He doesn't save you a little. He saves you completely. And the only one who can save you completely is the holy God of creation, Father, Son, and Spirit.